The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Brian Hunter with NCSI. Uh, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes for a few more people to join. So uh, hang tight for a couple more minutes. Thank you for joining. All right, once again, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is uh, Brian Hotzik uh, with NCSI. I'll be uh, conducting our, our training today. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, a few housekeeping items. Um, all of you are on mute. I cannot hear anybody. And so if you have any questions, um, and I highly encourage you to ask questions, um, in the Go to, uh, go to Webinar uh, box, there's a place for uh, asking questions. So please put them in there. Um, I want to keep this very interactive, and I want to talk as we go through it. So please don't save your questions for the end. Let's uh, let's kind of keep it interactive as we go along. But remember, I can't hear any of you. Um, thanks for joining. We um, are talking about land deaths today. We're talking about uh, OS deployment and provisioning. That's going to be our focus. Uh, but just kind of a quick preview for those of you that don't know who NCSI is. Um, we are a, a, a technology reseller of several different products, kind of today's our focus on Landesk. Um, one of our goals is, you know, you can buy Landesk from anybody. Well, we want to be a, uh, a, a very uh, value-added in the value-added reseller. We want to make sure that we understand the products, we provide these, these kinds of trainings, we have technicians that are able to help in these kinds of problems. When you have problems, uh, we don't just want to be that reseller that says, oh, well, have you tried calling the vendor? Um, and so getting you to understand your product better and having you use it better is, is, is great for us because it keeps you renewing the product, it keeps you buying other products from us. So um, we, we want to make sure to kind of continue this uh, going forward. So if you have any uh, suggestions on training topics or um, other products that you're interested in you want training on that as well, please let us know. Um, like I said, we're talking about Landis today. Uh, you know, if you're interested in any of our other products like HP servers and storage or Palo Alto Networks for Next Generation Firewall, Evolt for disaster recovery and uh, backup, uh, VMware and Citrix for application and uh, server virtualization, WebSense for web, email and data security, Digital Persona for uh, biometric authentication, you know, please let us know. We do these webinars uh, pretty regularly. Um, uh, for example, we have an upcoming uh, Palo Alto Networks webinar and an upcoming WebSense webinar. So if you have any more interested in those products, uh, just let your salesman know or email me, and I'll be happy to uh, send you more information about those. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about OS deployment and provisioning. This is a module of Landesk that 
Um, all of our customers usually say, I really wish I knew this better. I wish I knew this more. Um, it's one of the biggest time savers uh, inside of Landesk. Uh, de de deploying machines takes a large amount of time. Um, and so if, if you put the time into OS deployment and provisioning, we can really really have it pay off and uh, get the benefits and the economies of scale and be able to really leverage the tool. Um, however, conversely, um, we need to put the time into it. Um, uh, OS deployment is relatively easy, but you know, provisioning, don't expect this to be a couple of clicks and you're done. You know, this is not an easy button. Anyone that's selling you an easy button is, um, is, is, is not being very accurate with the time it takes to get these kinds of systems put up. Uh, I'm a realist. I know that it takes um, quite a bit of, of uh, energy on our part, uh, troubleshooting, but really, trust me, the end, uh, the, the end result is, is definitely worth it. Um, I'm also a skeptic when people say zero touch provisioning. Um, I, I generally think that's a lie. Um, if, if you're expecting zero touch, then um, I, I don't think you're ever going to get that. We can get extremely close. Uh, we can make this extremely automated, but you know, absolutely zero touch unless your machines come without boxes and someone puts them on the end user's desk. Somebody's going to have to touch it. Somebody's going to have to interact with it. So, all right. So we're going to focus on both deployment and provisioning today. Um, pretty much everything that we're going to be talking about is based on the newest uh, code available, and that code is uh, 9.5 Service Pack 1, or excuse me, Service Pack 2. Um, and so if you notice a couple of things where you say, you know what, I do mine a little differently because that's the way the documentation told me or the way we've set up in the past, uh, it's potentially just the fact that uh, uh, we have a new version uh, out, you know, with the, with the Service Packs and with the major versions. Uh, they, you know, they change, they update, they, they make it... Um, uh, make tweaks. You know, pretty much every service pack has has you know had a change in the way that OS deployment or provisioning works. So just kind of keep that in mind that uh, it may be slightly different than the way you've done it in the past. This is all based on this uh, service pack two code nine dot five. All right, so we carve it up into two halves. We have OS deployment um, and we have provisioning, and um, they're really two ways to accomplish the same goal. Um, they have their pros and their cons. We're going to kind of run through both, both of them today, and then everyone can uh, decide on their own which one happens to fit their best their their environment. Um, you know, that's one of Landesk's key takeaways: is we are not dictating from the top down, saying this is how you should do it because we're right and everyone else should conform to this way. Um, it's all about options. Different people need different things, and so uh, don't feel like one is right and one is wrong. There's just different ways of of doing it. So. Both deployment is kind of the classic imaging that has been um, included in Landesk for you know at least the past ten years that I've been working with Landesk, uh, uh, probably you know much much before that. Um, it's what if you if you've done imaging in the past, it's probably what you very easily remember. You create a script, you capture an image, you deploy an image. Um, it's it's you know it's nothing uh, no, nothing revolutionary. Um, it's it's kind of the status quo. Um, it's very easy to use. A couple of clicks, a wizard. Um, it really is not that difficult to set up. Um, you know, in an hour or two, I can show you most of what you need to know about OSD, and you you'll be up and going. Um, it's very reliable. Um, Landis has been doing it for a very long time. Uh, has has it kind of most of the kinks worked out, and so uh, you know, it's a very tried and true method. Um, however, there's some disadvantages to it. Um, uh, one day, land is going to kill off OS deployment. I don't know when that is. That could be next version. That could be 100 years from now. I don't know when that is. But based on everything that we're talking about, and you'll see provisioning is the, the wave of the future and the way we will be going, um, and Landis wants to spend its time. So you'll see that uh, less and less development will be put into traditional OS deployment, and one day they're going to kill it off. Uh, I don't know when that is. Tomorrow, maybe. Uh, 9.6 is just around the corner. Maybe they'll kill it off then. I'm not, not exactly certain, but uh, uh, don't don't get too attached to it. Uh, it doesn't support UEFI, which you know that's that's becoming a much more popular um, uh, system running on our uh, desktops and laptops. And so um, this this will become more and more difficult to support with uh, without UEFI. You just have to go turn it back onto legacy mode or whatever the whatever the backwards compatibility mode is for UEFI. So. Um, next, we're going to talk about provisioning. So provisioning is uh, the, the, the new way of doing it. It's extremely customizable using these templates. 
Um, you'll see, you know, when we run to that point, what what it really looks like. Um, but you know what? It's it is um, more difficult to get up and going. Uh, it's not one or two clicks. We can make it, you know, uh, half a day. You can have your provisioning up and going, and maybe it takes you two days to refine it down to exactly what you want. However, the end result is going to be extremely powerful for you, and it's going to be um, a great tool to make your deployments go a lot easier. So. Um, in the beginning, it kind of stinks, a little hard, um, but uh, you know, put the time into it. Provisioning is not really new. Um, Landis came out with provisioning, um, geez, at least five years ago, maybe more than that. Um, and provisioning was kind of originally designed for servers, um, and then we kind of co-opted it and said, you know what, this 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 is pretty darn cool. Why don't how could we use this um, and make our uh, workstation imaging work a lot better? Now it's 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 great and does workstations and servers and uh, is a great deployment tool. So we're going to kind of expand upon that and how it works. All right. So again, we're focusing on OSD first, um, the kind of the classic version. Um, we're going to run through some PowerPoints here, talking about it. I'm going to fire up on my console, show you a little bit more of, of what it looks like, um, and then we'll we'll switch over and talk about uh, about provisioning. Um, so imaging, you know, copy the contents of a hard drive to an, an image file. I mean, that's 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 nothing extremely new. Um, it's great for you know taking one image and deploying it to one, twenty, a thousand machines. Um, if these are new machines, if these are you're restoring existing machines that have had you know problems. I know some organizations that geez, they they spend fifteen minutes troubleshooting if they can't fix the problem in fifteen minutes, they re image um, just because it's uh, you know it's not worth the time to troubleshoot if you can get the image back up and going. Um, there's a couple of different imaging tools that we can use inside of the LANDEF ecosystem. So um, there are uh, file-based and there's sector-based imaging tools. So an example of file-based is ImageX. ImageX is the deployment format from uh, Microsoft, or it might be called XImage, but the actual utility is called ImageX. Um, it's, it's extremely... Uh, in tune with how Microsoft works and how their operating systems are configured. Um, a great example of that is the fact that you use it all the time and you probably didn't even know it. So when you go and throw in your Windows 7 disk, and they actually started with Windows Vista, when you go throw in your Windows Vista 7, 8 disk, whatever, um, and you go to hit install, it's actually putting down an image X image on that uh, machine. Um, However, the, the, it's it's simply a file-based operation. It's it's not uh, uh, it's not sector-based, meaning it doesn't actually put the file system down. It just puts the files on top of it. Um, then we have sector-based imaging. So uh, this just it doesn't have the same logic at the file level. It just grabs you know the the, the sectors. It's, it's a much more precise copy, but you know can be bigger and more bloated and and have a couple of drawbacks. And that's an example of, of image W. That's a imaging utility you get for free for uh, for owning land desk um, so we're going to be talking about that other ones would could be things like uh, ghost use ghost before um, those are other sector based uh, imaging utilities all right so image w is from land desk um, it's very very easy to use you don't have to pay a dime for it um, as opposed to you know ghost we could use ghost if you love ghost and think it's the best thing in the world we can actually take those ghost images take that ghost executable and image inside of Landis with it, but um, you have to pay for those ghost licenses. So image W comes for free with your Landis license. There's no additional cost. Um, very easy to use. Disadvantage, there's not, they're non-editable images. There are some third-party tools that you can use to crack the image open, but um, it's, it's a little more difficult and they're not, you know, 100% supported by Landis. Uh, but image W, usually takes care of everything you need. If, if you're on the fence and you're like, well, I don't know, which one should I use? I'd steer you towards image W, um, just because it's a little bit more integral into the way that Landesk works. Uh, image X is, uh, like I said, from Microsoft. It's a tool that um, they designed for their operating systems. Um, there's no cost associated with it, because it's kind of built into the OS. Um, it has a really cool feature about being able to apply patches to images. So let's say you go capture an image of Windows 7, and you have it sitting there, and you want to um, put Service Pack 1. With Image W, you would have to lay back down the image, install Service Pack 1, and then capture the image again. 
With ImageX, you can actually take that service pack and apply it directly to that image. So that's kind of a cool feature that uh, ImageX has going for it. Um, disadvantages, you know, it's not really an image. Um, there's no file system, you know, there's not an NTFS file system living underneath it. It's actually just, you know, the files that got together in a very specific way. Um, that's not really a huge disadvantage because why would you care? Landis still takes care of all of that stuff. It's still, you still treat it like an image where um, you, you put it down in the same manner. We just need a file system running underneath it is all. That's the difference between the two. So when in doubt, use ImageW. If you want to have a couple more advanced features and like fiddle around with newer technologies, stick with ImageX. Um, but in the end, I don't care. Use whichever one you like and uh, we will have really the same end result. Um, like I described, we can support uh, many different uh, imaging tools. Um, Ghost, ImageW, ImageX, I don't care, some third party one. You could just throw in some random executable if you have images um, for something. Um, we can do remote image creation. So the idea is we can actually go and capture an image of somebody's machine. Um, very popular use of this is, you know, customized machines. What about the, what about the president of your organization? What about some VP uh, or your machine. Think of how long it takes to rebuild that and all the custom nature of it. You can actually go and remotely capture that and store that on the network so that you could put that back down if you ever needed to. Um, just like we said, new machines. You got new machines uh, right from the factory. Throw them on the bench. Uh, slap your image on them. Uh, send them out to the, the workstations. Uh, migration. Uh, upgrading from Windows XP to Windows 7 or, you know, Windows 7 to Windows 8 or Windows 8 to Windows 9, or you know, whatever you need to do, we can use it as part of the migration process. We tightly integrate with Microsoft SysPrep. So SysPrep is the um, ability to uh, kind of customize the, the image to our liking. And this is a Microsoft official uh, format for doing that. Um, what we do is uh, we kind of interact with it, we customize it, but it's, it's, it's Microsoft kind of under the hood doing that. Um, this prep doesn't work with OEM versions of Windows. How does this affect Linus deployment um, is a question that I just got. So um, we, we can't, we, we're not reinventing the wheel with SysPrep. So we can only use SysPrep when uh, Microsoft lets us and in the, the modes that uh, Microsoft lets us. If, um, if SysPrep is not an option, Landis can still lay down an image. The image is just not SysPrep. Um, and there are some drawbacks to that that, that you know, you need to worry about. Um, we don't really have the problem like we did in the, in the previous days. Uh, I'll take a segue for, for 30 seconds for those who've been doing this for a long time. Um, we had a problem with duplicate SIDs back in the XP days. There was the security identifier that every image had. Um, and uh, we, were, we were always concerned that, that would be, if that was duplicate, that would be a problem. So um, this very smart guy who worked for a company called Sys Internals wrote this uh, new SID application that would remove the old SID and randomly regenerate a new one. Um, that company, Sys Internals, got bought by Microsoft. And now that he was in the fold, he starts going around one day and starts talking to all the different uh, departments, all the different engineers about you know, his utility that he wrote to regenerate a new SID. And he could never find a reason why a duplicate SID was actually a problem. And so um, there was one issue, some obscure thing with WSUS, but the actual core operating system, you know, and its interaction with domains never caused a problem. And so he actually pulled that utility and said, you know what, it was kind of a boogeyman that we had invented and it was never really a problem in the past. And so um, Microsoft still encourages you to SIF spread. They, you know, still require it, but it's for, for other reasons, for, you know, making unique uh, names, unique IP addresses, uh, you know, licensing reasons. So you, you always need to assist prep. Landis can't do anything over in the top that, uh, uh, that Microsoft can't do, um, but we do have our own little twist on how SysPrep works. So I'm going to show you what that looks like when we, uh, when we get to that particular phase. Um, Automated deployment, you know, being able to uh, get our images out there very easy, very uh, uh, hands-off. Um, and we use a, a Pixie server to be able to do that. So I'll expand on that here in a little bit. Okay, so um, we have Pixie, the PXE, pre-execution environment, and we have agent-based. So PXE is kind of cool. 
Uh, you take any machine that you know can boot from the network, which, geez, I don't know what can't anymore. You know, if it's if it was purchased in the last ten years, there's a 99% chance that it can. Um, you strike a key when you're booting up. It all depends on the manufacturer, F12, F10, F something, um, and uh, it lets you boot up the network. We can do it without an operating system. I don't care if it's a hard drive. I don't care if it's corrupted OS. I don't care if it's the OS from the factory. Doesn't matter. You can boot off of a uh, boot off that Pixie. Um, it's an industry standard, so you know all the major manufacturers support it. You're not going to have to worry about compatibility issues, generally speaking. Um, and uh, it's a pretty cool way to do it. Agent base is good for particular scenarios. So it requires the Landis agent to be on the operating system. So number one, it has to be, you know, has to have an operating system. Number two, that operating system has an agent on top of it. Number three, it has to be functional. You can't use this to reimage a machine that's incredibly broken. This method is good for, like I described earlier, if you wanted to take a, uh, capture the image of the president's computer every once in a while, or your computer every once in a while. The agent base is a good way to do that because the machine is up and going. We can tell it to remotely reboot, remotely capture, remotely boot back up into its uh, into its normal operating system. Um, so this is kind of the flow for agent based versus Pixie. Um, agent based, um, we copy the boot file to the hard drive, so the operating system's up and going. We talk to the land desk agent, we copy that across. Uh, we get that boot file ready to go. We actually go in and modify the master boot record to say, hey, in, next time that you boot up, instead of booting into the Windows operating system, why don't you go over and boot into this temporary file that we have right here? We're going to reboot that uh, after it's finished. It's going to master boot record is going to look at that new temporary boot file, load that all into memory, and then we have access to the hard drive to capture, deploy, or do whatever we want. After it's into that Windows, uh, into the Windows PE, uh, which is the temporary operating system environment that we get into, um, to do all of our imaging tasks, the imaging script kicks off, does whatever task, capture, deploy, whatever we had told it to do, and away we go. Um, in the Pixie process, uh, we boot the device with the, uh, you know, we this says using the computer to install the OS. Oh, without using the computer to install the OS, meaning you we're circumventing booting from the hard drive. We're saying right at the BIOS level, change the boot method. Just like you would say boot off the CD-ROM, we're going to say boot off the NIC. So we never get to the phase of actually reading the hard drive, determining if there's an operating system on there and doing something with it. We, we circumvent that. Um, we get a DHCP address. Now, DHCP is required. Um, and the way that, that Pixie works is we, we're actually going to get a, uh, a secondary DHCP request. Um, and we don't need to necessarily change our DHCP environment to support Pixie. A lot of the other vendors do, but we do it in a much more unique way. Um, and I'll talk about that here in a little while. Um, we download that boot image file from uh, from one of our Pixie representatives. Uh, and then once we're up in that temporary environment, we then do whatever we want. Image, uh, uh, capture an image, deploy an image, whatever. Um, we also have hardware independent imaging. So hardware independent imaging is cool because um, you can take one image, you know, I can capture a Dell Optiplex 755, uh, and I can go deploy that to an HP, you know, 5680 or a Lenovo ThinkPad or, you know, whatever. Um, the hardware independent nature of it makes it so that uh, what we do is we, we point it to a, a driver um, repository and it will index all of those drivers and then understand what machines need what and then copy that information down, um, copy those particular drivers for that particular machine down after the imaging process. And, uh, through the magic of SysPrep, we tell SysPrep, hey, look in this particular directory for those drivers. And uh, it boots up and finds those drivers and away we go. Um, in recent years, they've added the ability to do it with uh, installer-based drivers. So, you know, you have like an Intel chipset or something like that that is, is uh, not just some INF file or the zip file. It's, it's an installer. They want you to run the setup.exe. Um, we can script those to, to run as well. Um, it does require a preferred server. Um, if you've never used preferred servers before, they're not that difficult to use. Oftentimes they're used if you wanted to have uh, uh, server out at a location, for example, away from the core server for files to be downloaded from. Um, if you're just one location and, you know, you don't need any of that stuff, a preferred server doesn't have to be a separate server. It can be simply a configuration on the core 
that tells it how to retrieve things off that same core server. So I know that sounds a little complicated, but uh, um, it's, it's not that hard to essentially point it to the core server itself. All right, so Windows PE, what is Windows PE? It is the operating system environment that we are going to temporarily boot into. Um, and, and what it is, is it's just a stripped down version of, of Windows. Um, there's very, very little uh, to it. It's only like 160, 170 megabytes. So it copies across the network very, very quickly. Um, it, uh, it has been changing over recent years. Um, I believe in the last service pack, in service pack two, um, we've switched over to, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, so you can't hold me to this. It's either Windows 8 or Windows 8.1. I don't remember which one off the top of my head, but uh, uh, one of those two. So um, whether or not you're using Windows 8 is actually irrelevant. This is simply the temporary boot operating system that we use to do our work of imaging. I don't care if you're imaging Windows XP with the Windows 8 PE. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. You could image Linux with the Windows 8 PE. So don't worry that that, you know, that the PE is based on any particular version of Windows. They just want it based on the latest version of Windows because it's going to support, support the most amount of drivers for newest operating systems. Um, if we ever need to go and add a driver, um, into the Windows PE image because maybe we boot up into it and it's missing a NIC or it's missing a hard drive or something like that. Um, we pick the operating system of Windows PE, not of the destination operating system. So like I said, currently it's 8 or 8.1. We'll go look that up a little bit later. Um, and that's the operating system you would go in and, and choose. Um, Colby says it's 8.1. That's what I thought. I just didn't want to go out on a limb. So uh, we'll we will blame Colby if it's, if it's not exactly 8.1. Oh, Mark says it's 8.1 as well. So Service Pack 2 is definitely 8.1 is what Windows PE is, is based on. So, um, All right, so this works with the agent-based and the Pixie methods. Uh, it supports ImageX. Um, it supports ImageW. Um, we can add drivers if we need to. Um, and it's, it's, it's a great tool for us to, to, to do our imaging from. So that's what Windows PE is all about. Um, we kind of already talked about that, how the agent uh, deployment works, copies it down, modifies the master boot record. Um, most of the time, people use Pixie, to tell you the truth. Agent base is a fun little toy, but Pixie tends to be most people's primary way of, of, of doing things. So just keep that in mind. Um, it, like I said, it requires the landiscation. It requires the operating system to be up in a good working order um, for this to work. So it has a lot more prerequisites. Pixie, shh, I don't care. You could have the uh, you could have the, the the image, the hard drive, not even in there, and you could still Pixie boot. So um, let me show you a little bit about uh, how we would uh, create those different. Uh, uh, options and kind of what they look like. So I want to jump over to my console here. Um, so uh, this is my Landesk uh, core server that we're going to be using today. Um, what I want to show you is just some of the basics on, um, on how we can uh, create an OS deployment script. Again, we're just sticking to OSD for now until we jump over to provisioning um, next. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, uh, how to set that up. And of course, my Landis console is not running very quickly right now. Of course, it's not working. Everybody's watching it right now, so it's not going to work well. Oh, there, it finally finished. OK, so um, under our toolbox, uh, OS deployment, um, this is OSD. This is the section for OSD. This is the section for provisioning. They both live in the same family of operating system deployment. I know that OSD is operating system deployment, but, but know that they're, they're, they're kind of tied at the hip still. They use a lot of the same technologies. For example, um, Pixie um, and uh, ImageW. Uh, and uh, so they, they definitely share quite a few components um, from that perspective. Uh, so here's OSD. Um, just like most things in Landis, we have all and my so that you can kind of create your own or you can look at existing ones. Um, how do I create a new script? I just right click and I say I want a new Windows PE configuration. Um, pretty much ignore this, the DOS PE 
Um, I, I don't know why they haven't gotten rid of that, to tell you the truth. This was a pre-boot environment that we used in DOS back in the you know 8.1, 8.5, 8.6 days. Um, and it was amazingly difficult to use. So it's probably there for some really old legacy reason. Some customer needs to image Windows 98 machines or some nonsense like that. But um, it, the only pain and suffering come from using DOS. So don't use it. Stick with the Windows PE. After I say create a Windows PE script, I get to choose what am I doing. Am I capturing an image or am I deploying an image? In order to deploy an image, we need to capture one first. So we press OK on capture an image. Up here at the top, we need a name of it. So I'm going to say something like, well, I want to capture uh, the image. Uh, maybe I want to say capture Win7 image or something like that. Um, kind of a prereq to that would be, hey, I need a place to put this. Where am I going to put this image? Now, when we're, when we're connecting to this, we have the ability to map to a UNC path. Uh, and if I show you what my shares look like right now, I have a share called um, images. Now, do you need to put the images on the Landis server? No, I don't care where you put them. Any UNC path is fine. Um, on the server, it's convenient that they're all kind of in the same place, and I can know, oh, Landis is connected. The, the images are directly on the Landis server, but it's by no means a requirement. So um, usually what I'll do is I'll create an incoming directory inside of that. So I'd say, like, here's my LDMS server, backslash, backslash, LDMS, backslash images, backslash incoming. Um, and, and to tell you what, I'll actually go in and get rid of the the specific nature of this particular script. I'm not going to say capture Windows 7, because this script can capture Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1. I don't care. It can capture anything. So I'm going to say some, maybe something like capture image uh, with image w to Landes server or something like that. Oh, it looks like that's the next one here. But um, keep it a little bit more generic, because you can recycle the same capture script. You may have many deployment scripts, but you're probably not going to have that many capture scripts. Here you can put a description of what it does. OK, credential. We need a username and password to connect from the Windows PE share, or excuse me, the Windows PE preboot environment to the share that we're putting the image on. Um, that Windows PE environment is you know, not in the domain or, or anything like that. So we have, to, we have to kind of force all of our credentials. So here I'm going to say it's NCSI lab. That's my domain for this particular server. I'm going to say administrator, and here's my password for, for that particular share. OK, under image information, this is where you choose your imaging tool up here in the top. Now, um, image W and image W version 2, uh, which one should I choose? Well, um, about ooh, four years ago, five years ago, something like that, they came out with a, a, a version 2 of image W. It's faster, better, you know, good at everything, but it's not technically backwards compatible. So unless you have some old, funky image W version 1 script uh, images out there, which if you do, I highly recommend you change them over, everyone should be using version 2. So just stick with that. Um, here's where you can use image X. Here's where you could use semantic ghost. Hey, if you got some other, you know, crazy uh, imaging utility and you want to use that, great. Use other. I don't care. Here it says enter the UNC path directory to store the image file. Now, this is where we're going to put it, and that's why I like to create an incoming directory. So I usually like to go and copy that and put it in there. This must be UNC. This cannot be D colon backslash whatever. Because remember, what we're going to do is this is going to be executed on the Windows PE machine. It doesn't know the drive letter on the Lambda server. It needs a UNC share. It needs write permissions to that share. Um, in order to talk to it. There's a little browse button right here, but I'm a fan of going and you know finding it here and, and just copying it in the path. Not typing it in because you can you know make a typo like copy it and paste it in over here. All right, next. Enter the UNC path to the imaging application, including the name of the application. So what this means is, well, I know I chose this option up here, but I need to essentially point to that file. Even though it's in Landis' own imaging tool, it doesn't necessarily have an automatic link to it. You have to go and pick the exact um, file itself. That's OK. Um, it's just on the Landis server, and it's in the LD main share. And then it's a subdirectory called OSD, and it's a subdirectory called imagewv2. And uh, here it is, imagew. And so we can simply copy this path right here. And then you can usually hit Browse and then just select that image W right there. So um, you know, I like doing that because I don't like to uh, you know, make typos. So I like to kind of paste that in there and then hit the Browse button so that it validates that the path is good now. Um, and then I just point to the individual image file. 
Um, if I was using Ghost, I'd go point to the Ghost. If I was using ImageX, I'd go point to ImageX. Um, ImageX you can find in the um, Windows uh, Automated Installation Kit. It's called the Wake. Um, it's just a free download from uh, Microsoft, and there's the ImageX utility in there. Landis knows about ImageX, so you don't need to know fancy things like command line parameters and you know all that nonsense. It'll know it. You just need to point to um, the location here. Um, where is the system drive um, on this particular machine? This gets a little complicated. Um, for, for those of you that are, are not aware, um, what Microsoft did, I'll see if this server has it enabled or not, uh, or I might need to check my local workstation. Um, when we introduced uh, Windows Vista, uh, they, they changed the way that the system works a little bit. In the past, uh, it was easy. You had, a, you, know, you had a hard drive and you had one partition on it, and that was it. The master boot record points to that one partition. Um, well, we, we, we added some complicated um, things when they came out with Windows Vista, and it all has to do with uh, BitLocker. So blame BitLocker for this particular quirk. What we need to do is there is a, um, there's a system partition right here that's a system reserved, and this is actually what the master boot record points to. And the reason behind that is BitLocker would theoretically go and encrypt the C drive, but you can't boot an encrypted drive. We need to have some basic, basic files on the system to be able to boot it, and that's the um, 100 megabyte size there. So if your operating system has the ability to use BitLocker, it usually has this 100 megabyte system reserved. This is not the same as an OEM partition. So if you go and get a Dell machine, you probably have an OEM partition as well as the system reserved uh, partition right here. So it can get a little bit complicated in terms of um, what, uh, you know, what uh, partition that we point to here. We need to check on the, you know, I check the machine before I capture an image to see which one um, is, the, is the system partition. Um, and uh, uh, even better yet is the fact that um, with uh, disks we start counting at zero, and with partitions we start counting at one. So you know, fire the guy who came up with that system because that's extremely complicated. Okay, additional commands. This would be anything fancy um, you'd want to do uh, after the imaging process. Um, nobody really fusses around with that too much. I would, I would pretty much ignore it. So when you're done with that, you have a script here, capture to land desk. Um, if I click Edit, um, this is one I've kind of already created, but you can see it's not that many questions. Um, you could actually right-click on this and say Advanced Edit. If you want to get crazy and look at all the different actions that are happening inside of that imaging task, you can see what's going on. Kind of the, the behind the scenes here, uh, these are just a lot of kind of variable style stuff up at the top. Here's where it starts to get exciting, where we say Remexec. So Remexec means Remote Execute meaning I want to execute this particular command on the remote machine. We have numbers over here on the left-hand side. Um, the, back when we edited these scripts a lot, it got a little bit confusing because it doesn't necessarily uh, execute them in numerical order. It simply executes them in, in list order. So um, you, know, you could go in here and have this be remexec um, 513. That doesn't matter. It will still execute 0, then 513, then 2. It just needs to be a unique identifier right here. So if you want to go and add a command, you just simply need to have it to be a, a unique rem exec number. It'll still execute it in, in list order. Um, up here at the top, the top, we do things like we're just copying files across. Um, right here, we, get, uh, we copy some BCD edits and boot helpers across. Um, right here, we uh, actually kick off. Uh, it's copying down the boot whim. Uh, down here we're mapping drives because we need to be able to map a drive to that. Remember the images share that we had created or that I pointed to. Here we need to map it to LD main um, to access our, our imaging utility. Um, and right here, here's the exciting part. Um, we're actually going to execute a command called image w with all of these parameters that mean all these different things and switches. And, um, we're going to capture it to this particular location. It's mapping it to the I drive because up here we map I to the images share and then we're putting it in the incoming directory. And then we're using this variable called percent computer dash device name percent. So what that is, is it's the name of the machine. So when I go in here and look at my devices, um, if I'm going to capture this particular machine right here, um, we look at, what was it, device name probably? Device name. So it's going to take that, um, 
variable and put it in the script. And if you pay really close attention, um, that's the file name. Oh, we need to do an advanced edit. Right here down at the bottom, um, we're executing the imageW task. And this is specifying the file. And the file name is going to be the device name. So if I go and capture my machine, and it's called Win7 template, it's going to create the file as Win7 template. Um, and just know that you're, you feel free to modify that file name. You can um, uh, change that all you want. Uh, there is one requirement for it. Let me see if any of my images uh, are larger than two gigabytes. Yeah, so um, there's another command line parameter in here that says if the size of the file is greater than two gigabytes to slice it up into two gig max. That's the slash max two GB right here. If we have that enabled, which will be on by default, and unless you are really advanced, I'd recommend not playing around with that. It's going to throw up here and say the file name, um, .tbi, is the original extension. And then any additional files that it needs split past two gigabytes will have a .1, .2, .3, etc. at the end of it. When you rename the .tbi file, you need to rename all the additional ones in the exact same way. See how it's Win7? It needs to be Win7, 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 all the way up for all our additional files. You can't just rename the, the, the .tbi file. You have to rename all of them. So renaming is okay. Simply do all of them at the same time. All right. Next, we have something called the, the the Pixie menu. So if we go over here to our toolbox and look at the Pixie boot menu, um, we'll open that up and look at our Pixie boot menu. So um, you'll see this here in a little bit when I get to this phase. But uh, the idea behind this is this is a menu that's going to be presented to the user when they go into a Pixie boot. Um, and you can see I've created a folder called Capture and Deploy. I could create a new folder here and you know, called Training. What I'm going to do, Landis loves drop, drag and drop, don't they? I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to grab Capture to Landesk, drag it over to Pixie Boot. I'm going to drop it inside of Training right there. And um, when I do that, it's going to, uh, if I can successfully drop it, um, it's going to provide that under the, sub, you know, the subfolder called Training. Now, the biggest thing people forget about at this phase is applying it. This little thing right here looks like two pieces of paper and a tiny yellow, I don't know, yellow uh, arrow. Hit that button. That's the Save button. It says Update. You have to have to push that in order for any of the changes you hear uh, uh, be available. So um, let's kind of see a little bit what this, what this looks like from, a, uh, from an end device perspective. So I have a virtual machine here. This is going to be what we're fooling around with today. It's easier than showing off a, a physical machine. So um, virtual machines are great, great, great for testing um, when you're doing your imaging. Uh, and so I highly recommend that you use it. Um, let me reboot this machine. I don't care what, what state it's in. It has an OS installed, but I don't care about that. I'm going to, well, in this case, I'm just showing you how to capture. You would be going and um, uh, making the machine the, 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 the proper way. Um, installing the applications you like, updating it, you know, whatever you would normally do to prepare a machine to be uh, to be imaged. So um, any day now it's going to come back up and uh, we're going to be able to go in and do a pixie boot. So anytime it decides it's ready to do that. Um, well, let me take this time to talk about sysprep a little bit. Um, what you would do is you would go and um, execute that machine and put it in sysprep mode, in specifically a mode called um, auditing. Um, what it does is gives you the ability to, um, you know, like I said, strip the unique things out of that operating system and um, make it. Uh, make it generic, you know, it genericizes it, um, or generalizes it is a better term, because they actually use that in the sysprep GUI, to make it so that we don't have to uh, rename the machine after the fact or, or anything like that. It should be um, generic at that point. Oh, it's just my console window is not working. Let me just, let me reboot it through here. It may work a little bit better for us. So um, before you would shut this OS down, you would execute sysprep. Um, turn into audit mode, um, 
generalize it and uh, we would it would be ready to be captured. You wouldn't want to let it boot back up. Um, you would want to uh, you would want to have it in a state of that sysprep when we shut it down. Um, uh, question: Can you actually create your images um, uh, of virtual? So yes, I have some customers that use a virtual machine as their source. They don't go and get one of their physical machines and build it up and do everything. Uh, they started off as being a virtual machine, yes. Um, and so if you want to use that as your source machine, if you want to use um, imaging inside of virtual machines, there's, there's, there's nothing unique about a virtual machine uh, that will prevent it from being in the same world as the rest of your physical machines from an imaging perspective. So go right ahead. Um, I use it almost exclusively for my testing because it's so much easier. I can fire up 37 different virtual machines a lot easier than I can go, you know, grab 37 different physical, you know, pieces of hardware. Okay, so it all depends on the, the hardware, um, how you do this network boot. Like I said, sometimes it's F12, F2, Escape, you know, find out in the BIOS, whatever the manufacturer uh, recommends, and then you come in here and say network boot. Now, what's happening right here is I'm going to, everyone look real close, I'm going to press F8. That kind of comes up really quick and then goes away, so i got to pause it here for a minute. What just happened is um, we received a DHCP request, and then we received a, uh, a, a proxy DHCP request for our PIXI information. Other vendors, if you go to someone else and you say, hey, I'm doing PIXI, they're going to recommend you modify your DHCP server. We don't require that. As a matter of fact, you do that, it would potentially break our system. We want you to ignore your DHCP server, leave it exactly as is, and use a PIXI representative. I'll show you about that kind of a little bit later. But anyway, it comes up here, and I press F8. Um, if I don't press F8, it's going to choose the default menu option. What was our default menu option? Local boot. Let me show you that one more time, because it goes a little bit quick. I'm going to tell it to boot from network. You can actually go change this time, too, so it's a little bit, you have a little bit longer. OK, it says press, eight, press F8 to, to view the menu. If I don't press anything, here's what happens. It does that local boot. Um, and and that's kind of a cool option. What that gives us is, whoops, I, I missed it that time. What that gives us is the ability to, you could theoretically always have Pixie Boot enabled and only go and have an action associated with that machine, and it will change the menu. Let me show you what that looks like. So um, I have this machine here. I believe it's this one right here. I could actually go down and drag this machine onto a script. And if I do that and then start that script, you'll see what happens is it starts it, it kind of goes into a pending mode, and then it uh, is as soon as it's as soon as it goes to active and then back to pending, it's ready to be booted. Sometimes if you just kind of hit refresh here for a couple of minutes, oh, well, actually, it can't be the operating system up and going like this because when you do that, it's going to uh, try and do the managed. Um, uh, the managed uh, agent-based methods I talked about. So I'm actually going to go and kill that. I don't want that to happen. Let me go back into go back into the BIOS level, and there it will it will work better. So let's restart this machine. Let's go. Whoops, I wasn't fast enough again. Okay, we're going to kind of leave it right here. Uh, this is going to show us a failed state. That's okay. Let's just tell this to start. It should go into active, and then it'll go and sit in pending. And that's kind of what I wanted to see. Any minute now. Let's go test it out. Maybe it'll still work, even though it's not yet quite in active. If we go to network boot right here, what's going to happen is um, instead of local boot being the default option, it's going to come in here and say manage WinPE. Manage means I told from the server it to execute this particular script as opposed to WinPE menu. WinPE menu is I want to be able to choose which script that I want to execute. Let's go and run that one more time now that it's not in an operating system. It was up and going in Windows and that can tell it, hey, this is agent-based as opposed to managed. Let me run that one more time. See if we can get it to go active and then back down to pending. There it is, active. Okay. 
it'll go back down into pending here in 30 seconds or so. And again, what that's doing is that's changing the default option here to be managed WinPE. Now, why would you want to do that? Why, you know, what makes sense to do it that way? Well, um, some people say, hey, why don't we always turn Pixie on? We go into the BIOS and we say Pixie booting is the, the preferred method all of the time. It's always going to Pixie boot. If you do that, when it boots up into this phase, 99% of the time, it's simply going to do a local boot because it's going to call the LAN desk server, say, hey, do I have any jobs associated with me? The server's going to say, no, you don't have any jobs, do local boot. If there are jobs associated with it, it's going to say, yep, there are. Go ahead and run manage WinPE, boot right up into that operating system, and um, boot right up into WinPE, and then do our job. As opposed to WinPE, we're going to manually select it. So I'm going to go manually select that right now because my job back over here failed for some reason that I don't know. I don't want to sit here and troubleshoot it with all you guys watching. So let's just go in and show you what the, the, the WinPE menu looks like because it's much more common of, of what people use. So what's going to happen right here is uh, we're Pixie booting. We are connecting to a TFTP server, and we're downloading a 160 megabyte uh, image that we're just using for temporary purposes to boot into. This is not our permanent image. This is just a, a temporary thing that we use to image with. So we're, we're going to kind of let that run. We're going to watch this paint dry and watch that go up. Let me tell you about something else while we're waiting on that. Let's talk about um, what the you know, how we do Pixie, what the environment looks like a little bit more um, from a Pixie perspective. Well, we have this section under all OSD, uh, all of the scripts under operating system deployment called Pixie Representative Deployment, Pixie Representative Removal. Um, essentially what we do is we don't need to modify your existing infrastructure. We don't need to go in and say, you know what, uh, let's change your DHCP server, let's change your environment in order to suit our needs. We can actually change, we can adapt to any environment by going in here and saying, I want a Pixie representative, which is equivalent to a Pixie server per subnet. That way you don't need to go and modify any of your DHCP helpers or any of your routing logic or broadcast logic in order to support it. So it boils down to one simple fact. Put a Pixie representative on every subnet you want to deploy from. Um, if you want to deploy from every subnet, go grab a machine on every subnet and put a Pixie rep on it. Who can be a Pixie rep? Practically anyway. It's a small service. It doesn't take up a lot of CPU. It doesn't take up a lot of memory. Um, put it on, you know, uh, the, the secretary's machine. Put it on someone in sales, you know. Pick a random person per subnet. I don't care. They don't know they're a Pixie rep. There's no uh, real drawbacks to putting it on their machine. Heck, put it on a couple of people for subnet. That way, in case someone's gone that day, um, you can you can still uh, use it. Personally, if I'm the one doing the imaging, I'm going to put it on my machine because my machine's always going to be on when I'm doing the imaging. So, um, how do you do it? It's simple: drag a machine down onto Pixie representative, drop it there, right-click, start this, and it's deployed. Um, there's also a task there you saw for Pixie representative removal. Once they're installed, you can say, "Well, how do I know who is the Pixie representative?" Here under configuration, you can click on Pixie Representatives, which is right there, and it shows you. Um, they tell you don't put Pixie Representative on the server. I do, but uh, you know, I have a small lab environment here. If you wanted to boot, you know, thousands of machines via Pixie, it's probably not the best idea. So, all right, let's see our little friend over here. Okay, so he's finishing booting up. This is just kind of a command prompt window that opens up during uh, finishing the boot process. We're getting very close. It says this is Pixie menu. It's going to pop up with our Pixie menu uh, here shortly. There's our Pixie menu. Um, just like we did on the server. Let's capture deploy. We created this training. We created this script. We click on it and we press OK. What's going to happen now is it's going to create a background job that is executing all those scripts. Remember how the image was like like the actual doing the imaging process was like is step number 30 or 40 or something like that, it's okay that it sits here for a minute until something happens. You, you may not be able to see, but it's flashing some black screens, some console screens in the background. Um, you may see that, but then eventually our, our image utility comes up. So sometimes you have to be a little bit patient. Don't panic unless you're sitting there for kind of, you know, a minute or two. So it's doing our image process right here. If we jump back over to our server, we can look in that incoming directory. 
we should see the TBA, TBI file. Um, we didn't have a name of this machine, so it's just doing LD and then the MAC address because it didn't know who it was. You can see that file just steadily increasing in size um, until it gets completed, and then it will reboot the machine. That's the, the task at the end says reboot. If you don't like that, you can actually go and uh, modify your capture script. If you want to come in here, advanced edit. This last task right here, reboot. You can erase that if you wanted to, and it wouldn't be good. Okay, so um, we don't need to sit there and watch that uh, image. We'll just pretend that that finished, and now you have a captured image file. Um, I'm going to quickly tell this to Pixie Boot one more time so I can show you the next phase. I'm going to tell to Network Boot, press F8. I'm going to go down here to WinP menu one more time. Okay. Um, all right, so now I have an image, right? Sitting right here. I like to move it out of the incoming. I'll go create a folder, like I have an example here. I created a Windows 7 folder. Here's my TBI. Here's my .1 file. Um, now how do we deploy that image? So uh, we right-click right here, uh, new Windows PE configuration. We're going to choose deploy image. Now there's a few more options to choose here, but they should be relatively basic as well. So I'm going to say deploy. Win 7. This I need to be a little bit more specific because I'm deploying an operating system that can't be as generic as the capture script. All right, methods and credentials. Uh, three different ways of getting it down there. Classic download, that's a unicast. That means um, we, from the end workstation, we call out to the server or wherever that share is that has the file, and we unicast and we just download it. Um, preferred server says, well, maybe I have a bigger environment. I have preferred servers out at my location. I don't want to pull it across the WAN. Grab it from the preferred server. Great. Multicast. Multicast says, hey, let's do multiple machines at the same time. Save some bandwidth. Um, multicast is one of those kind of temperamental things. Unless you're doing it on five or six or more machines at the exact same time, it's usually not worth doing multicast. Um, you know, there's too many things that slow it down, and we have to we have to kind of temporarily put it in one section of the disk and then image it to the other side. So you know, unless you're doing big labs or something like that, I would I would shy away from multicast. All right, so is the image sys prepped? Uh, should your images be sys prepped every time that you have the ability to? Um, so I highly recommend that you uh, sys prep your images. So once you check that box, you can see it unlocks a couple of different options. Number one, hardware independent imaging. And that's a great feature. Let's definitely turn that on. Uh, profile migration, that's an OK thing. Uh, we use the user state migration tool from Microsoft. Uh, I like to usually tell people garbage in, garbage out. You know, if we go and are, are gleaning all the information off their previous profile and putting on their new machine, um, yeah, there's some not so cool things that come across and some junk. Um, you know, it, 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 it works, but in, in, in practice, I found it just a lot cleaner to, to manually move that stuff over or uh, better yet, keep the user saving all their information in a proper location that's not stored, you know, in the profile. So you can do it, um, just that requires a lot of practice. All right, so credentials to be able to connect. NCSI Labs, Administrator, Password. Multicast will be all grayed out because we're not using multicast. Same thing under Advanced. Okay, image type and path. It's image W. What's the path to the image name? It is LDMS, which is, and then something. Oh, didn't spell images right. Okay, images, Win7. You just point to the TBI. You don't need to point to anything else. Um, it'll know about the dot one, dot two, dot three. Just point to TPI. Uh, UNC path to the imaging application. We already saw that. That was LDMS, uh, LD main, LSD something. Image V two, image W. Um, same thing on the the partition down here. We would need to change the advanced option if you have some funky partition stuff. All right, preboot command. Anything that gets executed uh, before or anything that gets executed after in sys prep uh, functionality, uh, I don't mess around with these too much. If we're going to do really crazy stuff like that, let's do it in provisioning. Uh, so most people keep this pretty, uh, pretty generic. All right, so something interesting happens when we check this box right here that says use sys prep. It unlocks all of these options over here on the left-hand side under the sys prep category. Essentially, we are building a sys prep using the Landis GUI. Um, it's still Microsoft's product, and it's still their file that we're creating. It's their work. We're just using a GUI inside of here to create that on your behalf. 
Now, you pick your product up here at the top. You can even go in here and say, I want to use an existing sysprep file. Maybe you have a sysprep file. Uh, in the XP days, they were sysprep.inf. In the Windows Vista and on days, they're uh, unattend.xml files, so you just point to that. And then most of this will be pre-populated, and you just tweak it the way you want to. If you don't have one, no problem. Just ignore that. Just use your OS up here at the top. This is where it's going to put down the unattend.xml file. Sysprep is pretty smart. It looks all over the place for unattend files, uh, the sysprep files. Uh, we just put it on the root of the C drive, and that's the easiest place for it to recognize that and slurp that up and use it as the machine boots up. Uh, Multiprocessor stuff, you don't need to worry about this uh, in Vista and later, and so I'm going to pretty much assume everyone's doing that, so that'll just be all grayed out, Windows XP kind of stuff. Okay, all of these settings you'll just recognize from a typical Windows setup. What's the time zone? What's my volume license key? What is the username and password? Uh, or what's the admin password? What's the name of the organization? Um, volume license key, this can get a little tricky. Um, I highly recommend you look into getting KMS. Um, that's the key management ser server service uh, keys from Microsoft. Um, using MA key keys or OEM keys can be a little tricky right here. So um, I highly recommend you try and get those KMS uh, keys and server because then it will be uh, pretty much all the same key right there. All right, network credentials. Do you want it to join your domain or your sit in a work group? So you can say, yes, put it in the domain, put it in this particular OU, you know, whatever you want. Um, naming convention. So first of all, look at this checkbox at the top. First attempt to get and use existing computer names from the inventory database. Meaning, if I'm re-imaging machine, this was Bob123 before, simply look in the inventory and say, ah, it's Bob1234, why don't I rename it with Bob1234? Um, all it takes is checking that box up at the top. If not, meaning if this is not successful, then what do we do? Uh, this is a very generic one, LD and then the MAC address. It keeps it extremely unique. That's, that's great. Um, alternatively, we could go in here and say, well, you know what? I also want um, dash NNN, and I want you to start counting with, you know, 500. It'll say LD MAC address dash 500. The second one will be 501, 502, et cetera, et cetera. I personally like this. All right, hardware independent imaging. You pretty much don't have to do anything when you do hardware independent imaging. I'll show you how we have to set it up on the back end, but in order to turn it on, you just check that box. Um, this just says you want to use UNC to copy the drivers. It doesn't really matter. Um, otherwise, it uses HTTP. Generally speaking, it doesn't matter which method you use or which protocol you use to, to copy that down. Um, all right, next is Landisk Agent. We actually have the ability to install the Landisk Agent on that machine so that when it boots up and it's in its operating system, Landisk is there, the agent's there. So that's great. So we just need to point to the WSCFG32.exe. That's easy. It's on the Landisk server. LD logon is the share. If I can spell it right, logon. You just point it right to that directory. You don't need to put WSCFG32.exe on the end. You just need to point it to the LD logon directory, and that's, that's good enough. All right, you need to use name and password to be able to connect to that. Uh, again, we're not in the domain. We don't have credentials. Um, so we need to we need to put information in. Um, profile storage this is if we were doing stuff with uh, that profile management, where it stored the profile from our capture, where we copy it down to, etc. We're we're not going to cover that today. We don't quite have enough time, but this is how you would do that. All right. As soon as you're finished, you have a you know a, a nice deploy script, uh, kind of like this one. Um, and let's see kind of what it looks like. Let's see if our machine is back up. Yep, it's back up on our Pixie menu. Over here, let's go down to deploy. Let's say deploy Win 7. It's not going to be incredibly thrilling to you. It's going to look pretty much just like we did with the capture script. However, this time, it's taking that image file that we've created and um, deploying it down to the machine versus capturing it up. Um, so we'll kind of go and kick this off, and you can see uh, the image utility pop up. Again, we could be using ImageX. We could be using Ghost. Uh, our sample here, we're using ImageW just because it's nice and easy and convenient for us. You don't need to ever change anything in this screen or do anything. As far as you're concerned, you can hit the button that says deploy, walk away, come back, the machine will be up and going, land is gauging installed, ready to be used. Okay, uh, so I want to show you a couple of things about hardware uh, independent imaging. Um, how do you do it? Uh, well, thankfully, uh, Landis has taken a lot of the burden um, out of our hands as it relates to hardware independent imaging. Way back in the day, we did it. Uh, we had lots of crazy ideas of, of how to do this, and 
writing custom scripts and different things to copy the drivers down. They really integrated it um, very well to make it easy for us. So we just do a couple of different things. First of all, we build the library. So we put this little build library right here. Everybody has a share somewhere that has all their drivers. I pretty much guarantee everybody has this. You have some folder somewhere. It has a bunch of folders underneath it with all the manufacturers, all the different models. And inside of that, you have the different drivers. And here's the audio driver. And you know, pretty much everybody already has this. What we do is we just centralize it in one location. It doesn't matter if it's on the Landis server or not. I think it's convenient to put it on the Landis server, but you just point it to this path right here. It's going to create a driver repository under this path. If you have no reason to, just ignore that. Just leave that in that exact same location. As soon as you're ready, you just hit save. What it's going to do is it's going to go and process all the different files. See, it found 358. It actually processed 57,790 drivers in this repository. What does it do when it says it's processing? Well, it's, it's, um, it's not as complicated as you'd probably think. So let's go in and find a driver. Here's the Broadcom BC's BC57XX. Well, um, a driver uh, is pretty simple. Um, the, the, what we think of as a driver, this is actually the driver, the sys file, but the INF file is what references it. We have in here, um, this is kind of the mapping of uh, the, the, the driver to the hardware identifier. So every piece of hardware that we have, if we go to our device manager here, Every piece of hardware that we have, let's go to a network adapter, Intel, advanced, eh, maybe details, hardware ID. It has this VEN underscore, which is the vendor. All of Intel's products are 80, uh, 8086. Then you have the device ID, it's the dev underscore 100F. Uh, that should match up, it's not match up with this because it's not the right driver but it'll match up in this particular INI file. So we build a database based on these INI files reading in the vendor and device IDs so that when we boot that machine up and we're doing hardware independent imaging later, we're going to scan through all of these here in Device Manager that are unknown. We're going to say, here's the vendor ID. Oh, I found that in my database. It maps to this driver. Let me copy this driver down. And in my sysprep file, I'm going to point to that local driver repository to find that. So I don't copy all this garbage down. I have, what, I have 57,000 drivers. I don't copy all of those down to every single machine. I look in the database, I recognize the INF file, and then I copy the associated files. And it's smart enough because in that INF file, it points to what system files it needs associated with it. Somewhere in here it says, oh, you're installing this? That means you need this particular file. Um, and so it copies down the appropriate files that um, so, that's not that hard. I mean, this is kind of the extent of it. HII is shockingly easy now. Um, and you do need a uh, uh, preferred server installed to set this up. Again, preferred server doesn't mean another piece of hardware, another virtual machine. It just means the configuration here in their preferred servers. You can have your LAN disk server point to itself for preferred server. Or if you have a server out at your locations that you want to image from, you could also use that. So, not necessarily a separate server. It could be the same as the core. Um, but back in HII driver management, we have one extra thing in here called a sign. So every once in a while, you'll run into something stubborn. Um, go back to your driver repository here. Uh, let's pretend it's this Dell uh, and then this Broadcom. And you let's pretend I don't know what that folder. Whenever you see the, the uh, OS, like Vista, 2K, XP, I know that those are driver folders. They just, they, they're very common. But let's pretend you don't have that, and all I see is setup.exe. Setup.exe is not a driver. It's an installer that contains a driver. Um, what if I need to get this installed? Well, I can actually go in. I don't have it set up, so I just need to talk about it. But I can actually go in and say it's a driver package. And as a distribution package, if I had it, let's pretend that this was a, a, a package to install that particular um, driver to just run setup.exe slash s or something to make it quiet. I could come up here and I'd say, OK, when it's a Dell, and it's a Latitude 6000, and the operating system is Windows 7, I want to come down here and say, yes, I want to install this particular driver installer. It'll actually run the setup install utility to be able to get that driver on there. 
things like chipsets and, and things like that that are a little bit more OS specific or you know a little more integral, not just a video card driver. Video card drivers usually are just fine. Network card drivers usually just fine, but something funky or separate, um, that's when we can use this assign and say, hey, I want to assign an individual uh, install package, or you can go into the INF here and actually search that database. Do you remember how I said it creates a database based on the device ID? Um, you could come in here and say, ah, this is the exact version of the driver I want to install, when it's a Dell Inspiron 6000. Um, and so this is how we can kind of suck that in there. Um, all right, so let's close out of this. Let me go back to, uh, uh, let me kind of look at our machine here, see it's still imaging. Eh, we won't watch that, we just know that's kind of imaging um, in the background. Um, all right, let's go to back to our presentation a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about Pixie. I think I've kind of showed you the good chunk of it. Um, we already know about what Pixie is and how we uh, use it inside of Landesk. We have those Pixie representatives, put one per subnet. You know, that's important. Um, I showed you this already where under it's all, all other scripts. Um, and then after you have it deployed, you can go under configuration and then Pixie representatives to see who's the Pixie rep. Why they don't put the Pixie reps where you deploy the Pixie, don't ask me. It's just under underneath devices and then it's a subcategory called configuration. Um, how do you troubleshoot Pixie? Well, this uh, community document there, number 8358, uh, I don't want to read you the whole thing, but it has some great Pixie troubleshooting. Um, here's my experience. Um, the number one thing wrong with Pixie is usually DHCP. Either we're not getting the HTTP address correctly, or we've gone in and set options 66 and 67. That's a DHCP option. Um, if you have those configured, they will absolutely break our systems. Uh, Landis will not work well with them. If you want to go crazy and kind of out of the norm, you can use option 66 and 67 with Landis, but it has to be very specific. I recommend you don't do that, um, and uh, uh, you can just use kind of the, the default way that uh, Landesk uses it. We use the Pixie reps. Don't monkey with your DHCP server. Lastly, um, I'm a big fan of Wireshark. Uh, I'll just fire that up, do a, uh, have a VM, try to do a Pixie boot. I'll see those requests come in. We can, from that information, that Wireshark capture, I can tell you everything that's right or wrong with your, with your Pixie environment. Question, can I get a copy of this video afterwards to refer back to? Yes, I am recording it. I post it to YouTube, and we'll send out the link to everybody after the fact in case I'm um, going too fast or you want to repeat it or anything, um, I want to make sure to send that video out. Um, and this is kind of the holding queue in the boot menu. Don't worry too much about how that works. We kind of reviewed it a little bit. Um, we talked about that. Uh, oh, adding a driver to the Windows PE image. So let's say that you got a brand new machine and you went to boot up into this Windows PE environment and it said, hey, I can't find the network. I can't get an IP address. What if it's, it, it almost always happens with very new machines? Because we're basing it on, if you're on uh, the 9.5 SP2, you're using Windows 8.1 as the uh, as the Windows P environment. And so it should have 95% of drivers. However, Microsoft's going to come out with the, you know, or uh, manufacturer, you know, Dell or Lenovo or HP or whoever, comes out with a new piece of hardware, maybe it doesn't have the driver in it. What do you do? Well, you come in here and you hit this little, I don't know, it looks like a CD or something like that. They manage the drivers in Windows PE image. Um, it asks, what PE image do you want to edit? Well, the default location of that image is LDMS, LDMain, Landas, Vboot. I never remember where it's at. I just pull up this thing and it tells me where it's at. So it's a boot.wim. A WIM file is actually um, uh, an ImageX format. Uh, but if we come in here, we should be able to see boot.win is the is the file. This is what it's going to edit. Now, be careful. You can kind of screw this file up. And so you'll see I have a boot.win.back. Every once in a while, I'll go here and make a backup copy of it. If you're going to go to fiddle around with the drivers or whatever, make a backup copy of it uh, first. Um, so I'm going to click Next. Uh, it takes a while to kind of open that file up, but then what would happen is you'd see this little GUI right here. You would have the ability to then say, um, I want to hit add, I want to point to a driver and say, hey, this is a network card, uh, a XYZ Broadcom driver that didn't exist in the image, I want to add that. After you're finished, there's a big, um, there's a big troubleshooting problem that happens right after that. You just edited the image file as it exists in the Landesk vBoot directory. However, 
when you're actually pixie booting it, you're getting it from the pixie boot, uh, the pixie representatives um, folder. It's this program files x86 land desk pixie. So it's a different location. And so it's under images uh, x86 undie, uh, one of these subfolders in here, boot.wim, right there under boot. And so this is the master version on the server. This is the one on the Pixie representative. So the proper way is to run the command uh, Pixie representative removal, Pixie representative deployment. If you like to cheat like I do, I just come in here and copy it from the server to the workstation. You know, And I like to have a Pixie rep on my server or on my workstation so I can edit this boot file directly and fiddle around with it without having to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So keep that in mind. All right, so that's still opening up that image. Like I said, it just looks like this, and then you click uh, Add. Um, okay, so next I want to kind of get on to um, provisioning. Any questions so far on OSD that I haven't covered? I'm assuming since nobody typed in a question, that means everyone's good. Okay, let's get to provisioning. A lot of the same. Um, uh, understanding of what we've done before, Pixie, Image W, all those things we're going to reuse them again, but we're going to throw out the playbook. We're going to do it completely different and unique. And and I'm really excited about provisioning. I have been for a very long time. I think it's an awesome tool. Um, do not get frustrated with it. Well, okay, let me take that back. You're going to get frustrated with provisioning. Understand that going in. Um, but the payout is just so good in the end, it's worth the frustration to, to to, to kind of push and drive your way through it. So what is provisioning? Why do I care about it? What does it do? Let's break down the actions that we do to create a machine into small blocks called templates. Um, and let's make them very easy to create. I don't want you to have to script anything to do this. I want them to be very, wizard's not the right term because they're not wizard driven, but they're GUI driven. Um, and I want to leverage existing work that we've done inside of Landis before. Um, I want to make it extremely modular so that you you can you can mix and match and you could change things around without reinventing from the ground up. So here's some example templates I have on the right hand side. What are what are actions that you would do if you were going to just build a machine by hand? Forget imaging for a minute. What do you do to build a machine by hand? Well, I do things like prepare a hard drive. I uh, I wipe out the hard drive and um, uh, put a, a partition on it, for example. Um, I install Windows 7. Um, I install basic applications. Maybe I install the IT applications. Maybe if I'm in the sales department, I install the, the, the sales application. Um, these are the kind of different things that you do as part of a manual build. Well, we're going to create those as templates, and then you can snap them together um, to make a bigger system. So, you know, we, we use this inclusion system to link them together. So here's an example. Prepare hard drive, that's a series of actions. Install Windows 7, that's a series of actions. Install the base applications, that's a series of actions. Let's create a template called Basic Win 7 that includes the previous three. So when I say install Basic Win 7, it does all the previous actions first. It does it, excuse me, it does it in the correct order. It takes care of all the dependencies um, and just gives you a Basic Win 7. Take it one step further. Why don't we take that same basic Win 7 and add the accounting applications and the laptop applications and created a template called Accounting Laptop. So it's kind of this tree structure that you create to make a bigger and bigger build with those previous actions, those previous templates um, that are a series of actions, um, you know, snapping them all together. I try to use the analogy of Legos. I don't know if it's a great analogy, but, you know, you can kind of snap them together and, and, and make bigger and bigger things, and, you know, you could kind of uh, separate them out at, at one point into smaller actions if you needed to. Um, there's not necessarily a limit. It's not like, oh, you've included two things, now you're done. You can have layers upon layers. I, we've kind of stopped here at accounting laptop. You could have, okay, now we need an accounting laptop in the U.S. Let's put the U.S.-based customizations on it. Okay, now we need the accounting laptop in the U.S. that's at the Salt Lake City division. Okay, let's go and add more things on that. There's, there's not really a, a ceiling or a, a limit that you can do for your, your includes. Um, in provisioning, we have five different phases of the actions we do with provisioning. 
Number one, there's, that's environmental preparation. So that would be things like, well, what if I want to do a migration? The machine's up and going, the operating system is running, it's Windows XP, I want to do some profile capturing, or I want to find some files on that, or document something about this particular machine. Pre-OS install is a phase where we've rebooted into Windows PE, and we want to do some things before we actually install the operating system. I want to wipe out the hard drive. I want to do something custom to the uh, partition layout, something like that. Uh, the OS space is where we actually install um, the operating system. Hey, I want to lay down an image. I want to do a scripted install. You know, I want to do something to uh, get the actual OS down there. Um, next after that, we have the, uh, it's called the post OS install phase in the GUI. I don't know why they call it local environment here. Um, but maybe I want to do things like, hey, I need to do some sys prep functionality. I want to um, do hardware independent imaging. I want to, uh, you know, the, the OS is installed. We're still in the Windows PE environment. I need to do something before we reboot. And then the last phase is um, uh, system configuration. Okay, the OS is back up. Windows 7 is installed. I'm booting into it. I'm already in the, uh, you know, I'm already into the operating system, but I want to join the domain. Now I want to patch the operating system. Now I want to uh, install a, an application. So those are the five different phases. This actually makes it mo seem more complicated. It's actually less complicated than this when you actually see it in the GUI and you're up and going. Um, we have these templates. Again, a template is just a breakdown of actions. They're XML based. You can import and export those templates. There's some great, great sample ones we can pull off the uh, the Landis community. As a matter of fact, do not go and do what I'm about to do and create from scratch. You know, uh, uh, plagiarize. It's the biggest time saver out there. Go and grab the sample template and just tweak it to your desires versus creating from scratch. Um, so uh, what's kind of the difference between OS deployment and provisioning? Well, provisioning is driven, for, driven from the target. It's asking for actions and executing those actions versus the server doing it. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, like I said, it, it, it's much more customizable, can, can be end-to-end -end solution. However, the biggest drawback to provisioning, other than kind of a learning curve, is the time. You know, sometimes it takes a little while to deploy an image, boot it up, patch it, join the domain, install Office, install the accounting application. Um, sometimes it can take a little while. I usually don't care and say, you know what, it doesn't matter that it takes longer because it can be, you know, almost completely automated. I don't have to sit there and fuss with it. It's a much more customizable environment. Who cares if it takes a couple of hours to, to lay down that image? I don't have to fix it after the fact like I would with traditional imaging. Um, there's some great templates you can download even right through the GUI. You can click this little update templates button in the GUI um, and it'll pull down a bunch of sample ones. Like I said, Look, Dell Server and HP Server. They originally designed this to be a server-style uh, configuration utility. So if you set up a lot of physical servers, you know, and you need, you know, it's a hassle to configure the RAID controller, then install the operating system, then put on SQL, do all those different tasks, we can do it with uh, provisioning pretty much right out of the gate. There's, they're all prefabricated and pre-built. Pre but there are some great sample ones for uh, workstation operating systems as well. When the machine comes up, kind of here's is a little older screenshot within Windows XP, but this is the provisioning GUI. This is in the system configuration phase, the last phase. It's already installed the machine, whoops, it's already installed the machine, it's booted up into the operating system, it's ready to go, it's just simply um, uh, doing those post OS installation tasks, or those system configuration tasks, but that's what the GUI looks like. Um, I can look at the history. I can go in and say, show me what has happened with this particular machine. When was it, uh, when was it installed? Uh, you know, when was the last time it was re-imaged? Things like that. So you can right-click on a machine and say, um, view the history associated with it. Um, we have variables. Variables are very cool because you can uh, set things in one central location that don't have to be duplicated over and over again. Think about the password. Everyone sets their admin password to a certain, you know, whatever you want your password to be. Well, what happens when you want to change that? Do you really want to go in 20 different templates and change that of what the admin password is set to? I would rather create it as a variable so that when your machine um, is deployed, it will actually choose, you know, it will go and pull that variable and resolve that variable and put the correct password in at that time. 
Um, we also have template variables. Uh, template variables can be specific to that particular template. Ah, this one is the accounting um, laptop. For whatever weird reason, I wanted to have a different password or a different configuration of something. Um, I can have a template variable just for that one build, and um, it will, uh, uh, you know, have a, a different variable than, than associated with the global variable. Um, K sensitive. It, I don't know why someone went out there and and made variables case sensitive, but they did, and we are punished for it. So uh, keep an eye on that. Troubleshooting variables is, is a big part of provisioning. Um, they'll screw you up quite a bit. So when in doubt, go back and triple check your variables. Well, that they are, they're not spelled wrong, and that they are the right case. Um, all right, I want to jump over and show a little more of the console before I bore everyone to death with PowerPoint because that's not as exciting. All right, so how do I how do I deal with uh, uh, provisioning? Where do I go? What is it, you know where does it exist? It's right here on the left hand side. If I can get my manage drivers window to shut. Um, it's because it had to crack that big image open is why it takes so long to open up this manage drivers list and to close out of it. But on the left-hand side there, we have our provisioning templates. Um, that gives us the uh, ability to have public templates, private templates, shared templates. Um, I like the idea of using my templates. Remember, that's my login. That's a great training ground and test bed, fiddle around with things. Um, and then as soon as I think they're ready, go and create them under public. You can create your hierarchy of folders and so forth. For example, I created a training folder right here where I'm going to do all of our different provisioning actions today. All right, so take a step back and think about what you do to build machines by hand. That's what you need to use. That's the mindset you need to have when you're talking about provisioning. What do I do by hand? Um, okay, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, the first step is usually prepare an operating system. Prepare the hard drive, you know, wipe out partitions. Most OSs do this all automatically today, but, you know, let's pretend I want to be uh, very specific about it. So I'm going to go create a new template. I'm going to give it a name up here at the top. Call all of mine to start it with training because I have a bunch of templates and they need to be unique. The name needs to be unique, so I'm going to start mine with training. So say training underscore uh, prepare hard drive. All right, the boot environment. Uh, Windows P is the only boot environment we can use with uh, Provisioning should just choose that target OS, just, you know, choose Windows. Simple as that. Now I have a template called Training Prepare Hard Drive. Now, here are the five different phases that we talked about earlier. This is the phase when they are, the machine is already up and going because you're maybe going to do a migration. If I'm thinking about doing something from the, hey, I just want to wipe the hard drive and move on, I'm not going to do anything at this phase. I'm going to do it at the pre-OS installation phase. When I want to add an action, I just right-click and say Add Action. Here at the top, what is the action I'm going to do? I want to wipe out all partitions. Again, not something you would normally have to do, but you know, I like to show it off some of the flexibility that we have. The action I want to do is a partition. I'm going to press OK. Over here on the right-hand side, there's a drop-down box that says remove all partitions. What disk? Zero. Again, we start at zero on disks and one on partitions, and that's just a weird PC thing. Um, and I don't need to know anything about disk part. I don't need how to write a script. I don't need anything like that. I just simply come in here, drop down box, put in a number, bam, I have something to remove all the conditions. Now I want to create another partition. Hey, I want to create the create C drive or something like that. Or or create system partition would be a better way to describe what I'm going to do. Partition action. I'm going to create a partition. Disk zero. Yeah, sure, I want GPT because I want larger than two terabytes. Um, the size, I'm going to create a, you know, 5, a 50 gig partition. If you don't put anything in there, it'll just maximize the space and just, you know, fill it all the way up. Ah, yeah, drive letter. Yes, I want to mount that. Let's mount that as the C drive. After that, let's format it, you know, with NTFS. Oh, and we can even make it bootable. Look at that. You know, we can just very easily, with, when, uh, with the provisioning, we just check boxes and use drop-down boxes to uh, do all the different actions that we're going to do along the way. Um, all right, so that's pretty good. That's that's a pretty well prepared hard drive doing all those different actions. Um, this zero. All right, what do I do next? Well, I install an operating system. So training, install Win Seven. 
boot environment, Windows PE, target OS Windows. All right, what do I do to install Win7? Here I'm going to go to the OS installation phase. I'm going to add an action. Um, no, I'm not going to capture an image. I could just as easily have a provisioning script to capture an image. I'm going to deploy an image. So I'm going to say deploy Win7. All right, so they have this uh, uh, pretty easy way of doing it. They, this has actually changed a couple of times in the past version. So if you've used this in the past, it's definitely different than it was before. So um, uh, what we can do here is, is, is point to image W, V2. Here we need to specify um, the, the location to the image. It should be right here. and win7.tvi. Um, here in the command line parameters is where we can, uh, what, what I did there is I just hit validate. And it goes and says, OK, here's your image W. Here is your TBI. Let me put all the right command line parameters if you're just doing basic deployment. But then we can go one step further and say, you know what? I want to put a dash R command line parameter. I don't know. Uh, usually, you don't need to fiddle around with these command line parameters. Leave them as default. Um, you shouldn't really have to do anything here. But if you wanted to do something crazy, you could uh, change the configuration down here and validate and make sure that it's OK. In previous versions, I don't need to do this anymore, but I just want to talk about it. You would have to actually go up here and say, uh, map a drive. You have to say, well, I want to map a drive to the imaging share. You know, because I need to map a drive to LDMS backslash imaging and map that as the K drive. And then when I'm using my uh, action here, it would, uh, uh, oh, whoops, I didn't hit apply on that. Um, you know, I'd reference those local drive letters. That's unnecessary. We don't need to do that anymore. I can't remember when they removed that. Probably 9.5, they removed the requirement for you to um, map a drive beforehand. By doing this, it's intelligent enough to, uh, to go and do all that on our behalf. So win7.tbi. Invalidate and apply. Okay, so now I have an action called um, to install Win7. All right, what else do I want to do? Training underscore. I want to uh, uh, CTOS underscore HII. What is CTOS and HII? When I'm in the this phase right here, the post post OS installation. So I've laid down an image. The image is on the machine. Normally, I just reboot and away I go. No, I want to do a couple of other things. Well, what are we going to do? I want to configure the target OS. Now, what is CTOS? It just simply says, if I were to boot this image up, it's just going to be a Windows image. And it's going to continue on doing whatever that Windows image would normally have done. I don't want to end it there. I'm going to do some other things once the OS is up and going. So the configure target OS installs a tiny provisioning agent inside the operating system that says, hey, when you wake up on the other side and your image is booting back up, call back home to me. I have some further tasks for you to do. So CTOS is important. If you don't use CTOS, everything after this will, will fail. Um, what else do I want to do? HII, Hardware Independent Imaging. So I go down here and say uh, Hardware Independent Imaging. I don't need to do anything. I can check that box if I want to do, but uh, there's Hardware Independent. Um, if I want to come in and say, oh, no, I need to do HII before CTOS, there's a little move up and move down right here. Um, I don't recall if it matters which one of these you do first. I don't think it matters. Um, just as long as we do the configure target operating system before we, we boot back up. Um, what if I need to do more things like sysprep? I need like copy down sysprep file. I can go down here to say copy file, or it's actually called inject script. And I can say, oh, the script I want to inject is the Windows 7 unattend, and I want to put it on the C drive, and I want to say it's called unattend.xml. And then sysprep knows to uh, uh, sysprep knows to go and suck that uh, up and 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 use it as uh, as its sysprep information. Um, many people just commented uh, the correct way: CTOS, Configure Target OS, has a built-in step that actually reboots the machine. So always do CTOS last, otherwise it'll reboot, and you won't finish on those steps. So thanks, Mark and Nathan, for, for pointing that out. CTOS needs to be last. Um, OK, so where, where did we get this from? Where, where does that unattend.xml file exist? Um, well, I'm going to put something in here. Let's 
So we have a little button right here that says install scripts. So um, first of all, what I recommend you do, so I'm going to skip to, I had a link. Oh, here we go. This is a, uh, a sample. Look at this document 27038. Gives you a great sample script and sample uh, unattended XML file. So don't start fresh when you're done today and you want to go do some imaging. Um, Landis already has it is you know pretty prefabricated right there. Go take a look at the at that sample script under this particular uh, URL right there, two seven zero three eight. It's also just on the main landing page. If you hit the community page, then hit OSD. It's one of the first things in the uh, in the menu there. All right, so we hit this inject scripts thing. This is what you're going to download from Landesk. You're going to have a, a unattend file, a 64-bit unattend file, and this is actually a template. You could actually import that if you come over here and say right-click. Uh, how do we import it? One of these says, oh, there it is, import templates. You can hit that button, hit browse, go point to that template file that I downloaded, and it would suck it right up into the system. And that's actually this one that I have right here that I'll show you a little bit more about later is, is the Landesk prefabricated. Again, don't start from scratch. Use theirs, uh, their existing one. Um, so I have an install script box here. I need to get that unattended XML file as an item in the, the inventory or an item in the database and something that I can, I can, I can use later. So I'm going to hit Browse right here. I'm going to point to that file that I downloaded. Enter training. Here it is, the unattended XML file. So what does that look like? An unattended XML file is XML. So here's what it looks like in Internet Explorer. Um, they're, they're, again, this is Windows logic. This is all Windows logic in here with a couple of exceptions. Number one, here's the location we are going to look for drivers. This is how the HII magic works. Um, HII is going to copy the drivers down into this particular directory, the LD driver store directory. And then SysPrep knows to look there for drivers. So that's a little bit unique. Um, right here. What is the administrator password? It's not really percent admin pass percent. What it is is in our land S console, whenever you want to reference a variable, we have admin pass right here. Notice the case sensitivity on the A and the P. It's going to pass down the string of remote. Eh, you probably shouldn't do that. You should probably create it as a, uh, like for example, if I want to say password, instead of doing it as a string, do it as a sensitive value, so it's not showing your password to everybody in this screen. You know, I would do it like that. So it knows how to copy down this variable instead. Um, uh, so that's a variable. The product key is a variable right here, because again, percent, and then variable name percent, that's how we pass it. Uh, here's the name of the computer, LD host name percent. And you can see that uh, here in our public variable, LD host name maps to the computer device name. Again, if the machine was named Bob1234, we're going to rename it as Bob1234 via that uh, database value variable that we're going to resolve and put in the sysprep, dot, uh, the sysprep unattend .xml file. Um, whoops, I didn't want help. I wanted the install scripts button. So I'm going to point to that file. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it win7 custom unattend file or whatever. Operating system is Windows. Okay, right here you are going to be extremely uh, uh, coerced to check this box because you're like, yeah, insert variables. That sounds great. That's exactly what I want. This is actually not what you want. What would happen is if you check this, right now when we insert it, we would resolve those variables. We would change the password to whatever your password is. We would change the LD host name to probably nothing because we don't have a machine running. We can't pull that particular database value. You don't want to check this most of the time. You want those to stay as variables and you want it to resolve those variables at execution time for things like the host name. You want this host name to be very specific to that one machine. So every single unattend.xml file that's going to be spit out of the system is going to be unique because it's resolving these at regurgitation time instead of resolving them now. One other really funky thing, you'd think you'd hit close down here at the bottom. No, you have to hit the import button first. It shows up down here at the bottom. Then you can close out of it. It's just a funny GUI. A lot of people can't figure out where their script went because they never actually hit the import button. So they added a great little edit button here so you don't have to export it and then import it again, but you can just kind of look at that uh, data right there. 
Okay, so now back in our uh, provisioning, which is, oh, we're right here on it. Uh, CTOS and HII, I could go in here and say, the script I want to copy down is this new one, Win7 custom unattend file, plop it down right there. All right, what do I do after the operating system's up and going? Well, I want to, uh, uh, you know, maybe I want to call basic, uh, basic apps. And apps isn't the right term. Forgive me on that. It, I just don't have a better term for it. Maybe it should be called basic configuration. But I need to put training on the beginning because everything I'm doing is training. All right, so what are the basic apps? Well, I can do things at the system configuration level, like, for example, I want to join the domain. Join domain. What domain do you want to join? NCSI Labs. What's your username and password? Well, uh, the username is NCSI Labs backslash administrator. But you know what? I don't want to put my password in because when I change my password, I don't want to go and have to put it in 47 different scripts. So I'm going to say use the variable for the password, and I'm going to say the variable is going to be percent I don't know, admin pass percent or something like that, whatever it was in the public variables back over here. So let's just pretend that's what it was. You would want to obviously go and get that correct. All right, what, do you, what else do I want to do when I join the domain? You know what? I want to install the Landis agent. Because even though we have a provisioning agent on here, that's not good enough. That's just a little tiny stub. We need to install, uh, still install the Landis agent. Um, they don't name it very well. It is configure agent means install agent. I don't know who's in charge of naming at Landesk. I'll go find that guy and tell him they need to rename that. Here's the configuration names that we can choose. These are just all my Landesk agents that I have. It looks like I have four agents out there. If I had a particular configuration that I wanted, ooh, I want default Windows config. Again, what's the username? I could use a variable here as well. What if I have a variable called admin user? Um, check that box. What if I have a variable called admin password? You know, that way, whenever I change those values, I don't have to go and um, do it all over again. Reboot required? You know what? I like reboots um, because sometimes we don't have some functionality with, uh, uh, with like, uh, software distribution until we reboot. So, yeah, go ahead and reboot. But you know what we want to do is go back in here into our unattend.xml file, and there's a section right here called auto logon. And it's set to log on with a certain username and password. It's currently set to auto log on one. I might want to go tweak that to say auto log on twice. It's going to boot up the first time, log into the operating system, install the agent, log, uh, do a reboot, come back up, log back in. Maybe I want to do some more actions while it's logged in. I don't have to because the provisioning GUI can still run at the just at the control delete screen waiting for log on, but maybe if there's some reason I'd like that to, to, to automatically log on. Um, what are some other basic things? I, I, want, to, I want to patch the system. Uh, it's called update system. Update patches. Go down here to say, what do they call it? Patch system. Over here, I could tell to do a scan. I could do a scan and remediate. I could do a group. Um, you know, whatever kind of scanning options I'd want. A lot of people will go create a group ID. They'll have a group that says, ah, here's all of our approved groups. You know, they'll pick that, and then it will... You know, uh, the, if auto fix is enabled right here, we'll go and apply all the patches. That way, you don't care if your image is out of date. Don't feel like you have to go and update your image once a month. Um, we'll just do patching post image. You'll notice something when I'm creating these add actions over here on the side. There's this checkbox down here at the bottom. Stop processing the template if this action fails. What's the logic behind that? If I run this action and it does not work, completely die and stop everything. Eh, every once in a while, you may not want that. What if you're trying to say something like, delete a file? You know what? I really hate the um, C colon backslash page file dot zip. Okay, but don't delete that. But, you know, pick some other file. You want a temporary file or, you, you know, I don't know. Maybe you're trying to delete something. You probably don't want to stop in case that action fails because it's in use or the file doesn't exist. You may want to continue on. Eh, I don't care that that failed. Keep going. If you keep this checked, the whole process grinds to an immediate halt at this point. And so every once in a while, for certain actions, you may want to turn that off. Okay, so let's pretend that's all I care about. I don't really, really need to leave a file. I don't really need to join a domain. I don't really care. Just, just, just pretend that I build all that in the right way. Wow, I didn't hit apply on any of those, did I? Um, okay, what's our next template? Well, I want to create the accounting application. Boot environment, Windows PE, Windows. All right, so let's open up the accounting application. 
here's where we really start to leverage what we're doing in Landesk and other places. I'm going to say distribute software. I'm going to say install, I don't know, what do accountants use? QuickBooks. I'm going to come over here on the right-hand side, and I'm going to pick an existing package that I already had. Let's just pretend that that is QuickBooks. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I don't have to um, come back and uh, uh, get a new um, operating system, uh, or I don't need to reinvent the wheel the way that I'm pushing out software. I can simply grab this existing work that I've done over in the software distribution section and leverage it when I'm doing my deployment. So if you take a step back, the beauty of this is a lot of people before, they would create these big, giant, bloated images that had every, that had every application on it, or they had a very slim image and they had to modify it after the fact and put the unique applications for that particular user. Well, this does both of it for us all automatically. So I could create an accounting application and say I want to install that. Um, and then I can start building these together. For example, I can start including, what if I want to do a basic workstation? So I'm going to call this training underscore basic uh, Win7. I'm going to say my boot environment is Windows PE. My target OS is Windows. Now, I'm not going to put the actual actions here under basic Win7. I'm going to include other templates. I click include. I say I want to first prepare the hard drive. Include, I want to install Windows 7. Include, I want to do CTOS and HII. All right, let's also include the one we call basic config or basic apps. Now, I could go and use tra uh, training basic Win 7 and I could deploy a basic machine. But also what I could do is I could say, I want an accounting. So I'm just going to put training on the front of everything. Uh, let's just call this accounting PC. The boot environment is Windows PE, operating system is Windows. Now my training accounting PC, I don't need to start from scratch. I can simply go to includes. And first of all, I'm no longer going to worry about CTOS, Windows 7, preparing the hard drive. All of that's gone. I just say I want to do install basic Win 7. And it's included already. It knows to do those actions. If I go over here to my different actions. I don't see them right now, but I know that there's a bunch of different stuff happening at these levels that was included from another template. Um, but in my accounting PC, it's more than just the basic Win7 because I also want to install the accounting applications. So I say accounting applications. There you go. Now what if you have things like a laptop uh, applications, things that are unique to laptops that we don't put on desktops, VPN clients, uh, wireless, you know, whatever. Um, let's pretend I have something, some special software that says install the VPN client with two Ps. Distribute software. I'm going to go on, again, I'm pretending here, pretend that's a VPN client. Now I can say um, that I have a, uh, a template called training accounting laptop. My training accounting laptop can include the template called an accounting PC. And then, oh, it's a laptop. Let's go ahead and throw this on top. Let's do the training uh, laptop application. Um, it's going to take care of everything. It's going to know that these are all linked together and to do them in the proper order. And when I go back and say, eh, you know what? We made a mistake. When we're imaging our machines and we're doing the hard drive, we really want to change the size of this to be 463,000, I don't know, whatever. Let's say you go back and make a change, that's okay. It will actually um, you know, automatically happen in all the subsequent builds that we have because these other machines are simply linked to that one that says um, uh, prepare the hard drive. Um, you can actually sever that link if you ever need to. For example, training account laptop, eh, I need to make something just far too unique. I can actually right click on this and say condense. What condense does is it makes a copy of it and instead of, here's the original, the original is just includes. I don't really see what's going on because I'm just including it here. In my new condensed version, it actually takes all of the actions and puts them directly in here, no longer includes it. It's like you're severing the ties. You're saying make a copy of it, sever all the ties, I'm forking this to be a new configuration. 
So that's a that's a condensed. Um, Okay, so how do we how do we bring this to fruition? What do we do as kind of a next step? Well, let's come over here. You can see our, our machine, you know, came up. Obviously, my build I didn't have it automatically logging in, but uh, this came back from our, our OSD deployment uh, a little while ago. Let's get back into um, into our Pixie mode. But instead of choosing Win PE menu, what we're going to do is we're going to hit F8. And we're going to go down to Win PE provisioning. Let's boot into that for a minute. What we're going to do is we have uh, one of two different ways that we can do it. We can either find the machine as it exists up here on the top, it's actually this one right here, and we can drag it down onto a provisioning template, or we can, right here through the console, log in with the username and password and pick a provisioning uh, template. They put the username and password on there because WinPE, unfortunately, technically anybody can go and do that. Anyone can hit F8 or F2 when they're booting up and go and reimage the machine. Provisioning, they made it so that there was an authentication barrier kind of sitting in front of that. Um, all right, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to talk about other things while this boots up. Uh, let me jump back to my uh, PowerPoint here. We talked about uh, injecting the, the scripts. We talked about the configure target operating system, the CTOS. Um, how do you troubleshoot provisioning? What do you, what do, you do when it doesn't work? This is extremely important because uh, you're going to run through a provisioning script 5, 10, 20, 30, 100 times to get it tweaked exactly the way that you want to. I like to cheat. I'm, I'm always a fan of taking shortcuts. That's just, that's just one of my favorite things. Let me show you how you take a shortcut. So think about that one that we just looked at, the one that we we're condensing down. Uh, first of all, condensing is a good, great trick. If I'm trying to troubleshoot the training account laptop and I don't know where I'm going wrong, condense it and then fiddle around with this one, because I can break it all day long, and I'm not breaking you know, my previous configuration. When I go in and edit this particular template, I can go in and say, you know what? This is quick. This is quick. Deploying Windows 7, doing HII, booting up and install QuickBooks, these things take a really long time. Do I really want to go and reimage it every single time? What I'll do is I'll say, you know what? This machine, it booted up, and it just failed on installing QuickBooks. Why should I start over from scratch? Just come in here and erase these previous actions. Say, no, don't do all of this. The machine's already up and going. Don't reimage it just to do those actions. I want you to just start with where you had completed last. You know, if the machine is halfway up and you know the operating system's there, we don't need to practice reimaging. We know that works. Let's just start at this phase and you can kick off the template um, to just run against this phase and onward. Um, that that saves you a huge amount of time when you're when you're troubleshooting. Um, and that brings you to a, another interesting uh, component. Notice how I was able to get rid of everything except for system configuration. I have some customers that use provisioning strictly for difficult application installs. What if you have an application install that you need to install .NET, then you need to reboot, then you need to install this particular update, then you need to reboot, then you need to log in as administrator and install this driver, then install the application. You know, something really funky that you'd have to normally do by hand. You can do all these actions. We could go in here and say, hey, no problem. In between installing uh, QuickBooks and the agent, why don't we go and do a reboot? You know, So uh, you know, it's smart enough to say, hey, after this reboot, I want you to boot back up and start doing the provisioning action afterwards. So it's, it's more, than just, uh, more than just for operating system requirements. Um, OK, uh, let me cancel out of this. And again, I'm going to cheat just a little bit. Because I, from a previous action, I had uh, I had the provisioning. It, there, there was a there was a previous action that was pending. It was told to do. Uh, it thought it was coming back up and, and installing the the agent because it was up in Windows. And it really was. Um, let's just start the provisioning GUI, which we go into the folder called LD provisioning and run LD provisioning.exe. You should reboot and do it the proper way. But I like to cheat. I like to just run that GUI and it starts over again. There's actually one for Pixie as well in the uh, X drive, you say LD, no, you want the LD client, and you say Pixie menu start. That, that gets the Pixie menu to come back up if you ever wanted to not have to reboot the whole way as well. Okay, so now at this point, I can either put in my credentials right here, which I'll do, NCSI Labs, Administrator, Password, and it will give me all the templates that I have available to me, and I could choose one to be executed. The alternative is, 
we would have this is my computer name. I could drag it down to and drop it on a template that I would want to run and then choose when I want that to be executed. So either way, it's, it's exactly the same as far as I'm concerned. There's, there's really no difference. It's just who started it and when it started. Um, here's my template. Let's go pick templates. Um, uh, apparently, I'm logged in as a different user because I don't have. Let's see, if, oh, there I am. Um, all, all of mine are probably bogus. They probably didn't work the right way. So I'm going to cheat and use this Windows 7 Image Deploy HII. I'll show you what it looks like after the fact, but uh, um, it's going to kick it off and it's going to start running those actions. And the first action is, you know, wipe out the hard drive. Second action, start deploying an image. Third action, CTOS. Fourth action, HII. Fifth action, reboot and boot up into the operating system, you know, something like that. So there it's kicking off, it's doing the partition action. You'll see some kind of text here in the background, but these are the actual actions kicking off. There I am, I'm imaging. Um, here's my kind of, like I said, prefabricated one that is a sample from Landat. It's running through all the, these different tasks and, you know, we're right here. Um, how do I know that we're right here? Well, we have some great feedback from a provisioning perspective. If I right click on a machine, and say view provisioning history, it's going to show me all the times I've run provisioning on this machine. So this particular one is right here. I can select it and I can see green checkbox means it succeeded with that task. Um, this means it's still running. I think it's a red splotch or something like that that says it failed that particular provisioning action. So scripting is, is or OSD is a little bit harder to troubleshoot. This says exactly the phases it went through, exactly the phases that it, uh, it potentially failed. Um, so that's a great way to, to troubleshoot. So um, when you're troubleshooting provisioning, like I said, do that cloning, mess around with the clone version, remove variables, get rid of those things. They are, unless you're great and always check that their uppercase and lowercase is correct, I oftentimes have, have uh, issues with them. Uh, manually execute the tasks. You know, remember, we're just executing these things in that Windows P environment. Try opening up a command prompt um, and running whatever command we think that's running on the back end to see what would happen. Um, here's a great uh, a community article that talks about the uh, log files and where those log files are put. This article 29699 shows you where the core log files are and the client log files are. Um, like I said, not just for OSD, patching. A lot of people use it for patching because you can do complex reboot or, you know, uh, people would do deep freeze and unthaw them and repatch and, you know, things like that. So you could do complicated uh, uh, patching. All right, sorry guys, we're out of time, um, and so uh, we have a couple more minutes if everyone wants to use the little chat window to ask any questions. Uh, we have a question from the pre previous OSD section. I didn't want to go back to it because we were kind of into provisioning, but in HII assigned, I see the list of machine models and the contents of each. However, when I select INF and populate by select the device ID, nothing shows up when I do a search. Um, Daniel, you need to make sure that you already have the driver database built. Um, when you go into here in your build library, make sure that it shows some drivers in here. This needs to be completed as a step first before you go back and look at that manually assigned because it's pulling from this database. So go to the HII driver repository manager first, then that should populate the, the other section. Uh, it, yes, it's already built. Um, send me an email after this. We'll probably have to troubleshoot what's going on and why it's missing. So uh, just send me an email. Um, and I'll hit you up on how to fix that. Okay, uh, Matt has a question. Does provisioning leave behind the unattend XML with an encrypted password? So interesting question. Um, un uh, provisioning, well, not provisioning, sysprep. Sysprep is a Microsoft function. We put the unattend.xml file in the, um, wherever you want to put it. Uh, Microsoft then does whatever it wants after the fact. Um, to the best of my knowledge, Microsoft erases all of it. It goes and deletes that unattended XML file because I never see it sitting on the root of the C drive. However, I think you can change within SysPrep to have that behave differently if you don't want to. Worst case scenario, worst case scenario, have one of the actions in provisioning um, be delete file. Remember, we even saw delete file. So you could even have that run after the fact to say, eh, just in case I want to add an action that says to delete a file. And this is a great example of one that you want to uncheck this box to stop the provisioning. In case it's not there, don't fail. Just, you know, just move on. So, yep, we can see uh, unattend.xml. But I believe that it's already gone to begin with. But can't hurt to put that in. Um, yes, I record these webinars. 
um, and just give me a couple of days. I have to process it. I upload it to YouTube, um, and I can send out everybody a link of the recorded webinar so you can go back and uh, watch it as a reference. So keep an eye on your email in the next couple of days. I'll send out a link for, uh, for that. Uh, can provisioning be used to modify local group policies? Provisioning can be used to do anything. Um, whether it should be used is a different story. So um, group, local group policy, those are just INF files. If you wanted to have system configuration section, um, say add action, yes, I want to uh, download a file. Yes, I could go in here and pre, you know, create that whatever the local group policy file ends up living like, and I would need to know the destination path. So we don't have a a GUI way of saying tweak this local security policy file, but if you export it to a file that we can actually copy down, we can absolutely do that. So that's kind of a yes and a no. With a, with some advanced tweaking, yes, you could uh, you could do it. Um, can you use the boot.win files from WBS? So um, yes and no as well. Generally speaking, no. Our boot.win that we have, open, our boot.wim is very customized. Um, it has our land desk agent in it. It has the provisioning agent in it. It has some login scripts to point to the land desk server. So ours is pretty darn customized. If you really wanted to hack this thing and put it in your existing WIM file, great. But I don't believe you'd really want to do that. But remember, the boot.wim is just for booting into Windows PE. A normal WIM file for ImageX that you want to lay down Windows 7 operating system, absolutely we can use that. You don't have to capture the ImageX within Landesk in order to deploy it with Landesk. You could capture it in some other utility. I don't care where you get it from. Just get that ImageX file, plop it down in the images share, and um, away you go. You could uh, you could deploy that image. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, our boot.wim is small, only for Pixie booting. Um, you could use other WIM files uh, to actually deploy other uh, land desk images if you had a larger WIM file kind of thing. Okay, uh, that looks like it's all the questions. Thanks for your time, guys. Um, please give us feedback if you would like, uh, uh, what do you want to see for the next training. If you need more in-depth, this, this was a good overview, but as you see, we could go on for provisioning for days and days. And we have some great engineers that would love to help out with that. Um, if you want kind of a jump start package and say, hey, let's, uh, you know, I need you to help me get going and get it configured and deploying some images, images. we have some great packages to have our engineers come out on site and help you get it, uh, it configured and get over that hump in the beginning of, of the difficulty associated with provisioning. So um, please hit up your salesperson or myself if you don't know who your salesperson is. Um, uh, and we'll be more than happy to uh, uh, help you out with that. So, again, thanks a bunch for your time, uh, guys. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns or so forth, uh, feel free to, to get in touch with us. So uh, thanks, and have a good day.